so welcome to the uh, 11th lecture of uh, multi phase flows what we'll do today is just uh, continue from where we left off in the last class okay and uh, the idea is uh, to try and understand how boundary conditions can be uh, formulated so if you remember what we uh, i said was that if you have a surface whose outward normal is given by say n okay then the stress component on that surface acting along the t direction is given by n dot t dot t. So, the reason why I have used this kind of a notation is this tells you that you have a surface on which you are trying to find the stress components ok. This is the direction of the normal to the surface because that is what you are interested in ok and on that surface remember you can have different directions just like and this is the second index that we were talking about when we talked about the stress tensor. So, if you want to find out the component in the direction t this is the um, way you would go about calculating it. Now, I am going to explain to you how this is actually evaluated ok. So, remember the n is going to be given by I can write this as n i e i. So, this are the unit vectors. So, I have a let us for the sake of simplicity assume it is a Cartesian coordinate system. Though I am not specifically saying x, y, z, I am just going to keep it in terms of i, j, k. But uh, these are the unit vectors in the three classical directions x, y, z or r, theta, z depending upon cylindrical or Cartesian or vice versa, ok. Similarly, t is a vector and that I am going to I am going to write as T subscript L E subscript L. So, again L is I L go from 1 to 3 ok. So, I comma L go from 1, 2 and 3. So, these are the components of the vector this is the unit vector. So, E 1 uh, t 1 t 1 e 1 t 2 e 2 t 3 e 3 ok plus. So, because we are using the summation notation and what about the stress tensor this we will write as tau i j ah, i j k e j e k ok. The stress tensor is written in this form you have two subscripts one telling you the direction of the normal the first one tells you the direction of the normal of the surface the second one tells you the direction of the uh, in which the component is acting ok. So, tau x y tells you that it is acting on a surface whose outward normal is x and in the y direction. So, that is basically what it is what I want to do is explain to you how this particular term is evaluated ok. So, now n dot t dot t is going to be written as n i e i dotted with tau j k e j e k dotted with t l e l. There is a specific reason why I have chosen these indices differently 
because I want to make sure that this con the indices if I chosen it to be the same then you would not know how to take the dot product because EI dotted EI will always be 1 okay. We want to make sure that uh, the contribution of EI dotted EJ is only when I is equal to J okay. So how do I go about doing this evaluation? You see a dot here and when, when you want to take this dot product you are going to look at the unit vectors adjacent to it, the dot product. The unit vectors adjacent to the dot are the EI and the EJ. So that means I am going to do a EI dot EJ. If I look at this dot, the unit vectors adjacent to this are the EK and the EL okay and therefore going to do a dot of EK with EL. So when I do the dot of this, I would get a scalar, I get a do a dot of this, I get a scalar and the end of it I get a component acting in the normal direction okay. So what I am going to get at the end of doing this operation is a scalar. So let us do this guy first, this is going to contribute only when i is equal to j okay. When i is not equal to j, ei dot ej because they are perpendicular is going to be 0 okay. So I am going to write this as ni, I am going to write this as tau ik because I am just putting i equal to j, ei dot ej will be delta ij which is 1 so that goes off. I am left with ek dotted with tl el. Now I have just taken care of the first dot, I need to take care of the second dot and that is going to be contributing only when ek is equal to el okay and this gives me ni tau ik tk because L must be equal to k only then this guy will contribute okay. So I have ni tau ik tk, this is the expression for n dot t dot t, what is tk, tk is nothing but the components of the tangent vector, what is ni, the components of the normal vector okay and tau ik you know how to evaluate because depending upon the axis. So what I have done is given a particular axis x, y, z. I know the components of n in terms of x, y, z, I know the components of t in terms of x, y, z okay and uh, once you know that you know what the stress stress components are in terms of x, y, z, tau x, y, tau x, z, etc. and you can just evaluate this. Remember this is being summed over both i and k okay, there is a double summation because i is being repeated, k is being repeated okay. So this is a double sum since both i and k are repeated okay and uh, if you want me to be explicit I will just take i equal to 1 first I have i tau 1 1 t 1 plus n 1 tau 1 2 t 2 this is being summed over k the second index for i equal to 1 and then I do for i equal to 2 plus n 2 tau 2 1 t 1 plus n 2 tau 2 2 t 2 these are the four terms that I get okay i is 2 and k is 2 okay. So this is how you would go about evaluating the uh, stress component. What we are going to do next is see, um, go back to that example of the triangle which we took, we are going to evaluate a stress component using the physical argument and using the mathematical formula to just convince ourselves that they are both giving you the same expression okay. So is this clear? We will go back to this very uh, easy to draw a triangle with angle theta and this remember was my x direction, this remember is the y direction, so this is delta y and uh, I have sigma x x this way, I have y in this direction and this direction is tau y x okay 
and uh, this is the normal direction. Is this correct? This is theta, this is also theta, okay. What I am going to ask is what is the stress component acting on this inclined on the along the hypotenuse on the hypotenuse but in the x direction that is the question okay. The stress component on the hypotenuse in the x direction. So, that is going to be given by tau n x because this is the one is acting on the hypotenuse. The first subscript tells you that the perpendicular to on that surface is the n direction and the direction of the stress is actually in x direction, okay. So, tau n x tells you what this stress component is that we are, what we are interested in is finding out tau n x. So, let us do it the physical way we keep in mind that those acceleration terms the body force terms are all of higher order. So, they disappear and what we have is only the uh, forces which are acting on the surface okay. Uh, retaining only the surface terms surface force terms which are of order epsilon, what do you get? You should get sigma xx multiplied by delta y okay, plus tau yx multiplied by delta x okay plus tau n x multiplied by delta l equal to 0. This is the first component balance in the x direction okay. This is the force balance in the x direction. And uh, I am going to rearrange things a little bit here and tell you that tau n x is going to be equal to minus sigma x x delta y divided by delta l minus tau y x delta x divided by delta l. And clearly from the figure delta y by delta l, this is delta l is the hypotenuse for you is nothing but sin theta is that right. So, this is minus sigma x x sin theta and uh, and this is tau y x cos theta. So, the point I am trying to make here is that on this surface on this surface the stress component acting in the x direction is given in terms of my classical stress tensor components sigma x x and tau y x, but then there is a sin theta and a cosine theta which I have to factor in okay. So, this I got from my physical argument. Now, what I want to do is I want to redo the same thing using my formula okay because that is the whole idea we had a physical argument we had a mathematical argument. So, now we are going to evaluate tau n x okay using the mathematical formulation. So, how would you define tau n x? Tau n x using the mathematical formulation is going to be given as n dot t dot I want it in x direction okay I want it in the x direction. So, I am just going to write this as uh, E x okay. 
Now, uh, just for the sake of illustration, rather than uh, talk about 1 and 2, E1, E2, etc., though that is what I really should be doing, I am going to talk in terms of x and y, okay, because we are doing things in Cartesian coordinates, okay. So now, uh, I could have put this as E1. We can do that also right now, in fact. We can do this right now. Why don't we just do that? Mm, E1, where 1 is the x direction and 2 is the y direction. I just changed my mind. But in order for me to evaluate this, I need to know what is n, the direction of the normal, okay. Now, if you look at the figure over there, the direction of the normal is such that it has two components. It has both an x component and a y component. The y component is going to be given by cosine theta, negative cosine theta, and the x component is going to be given by negative sine theta, okay. So, n is um, x component is minus sine theta. Instead of Ex, I am going to put E1 and it is minus cosine theta E2, okay, that is N and this of course is simple for me, I have only E1 here and T remember is um, tau Ij. Um, E i e j because the others are fixed e 1 2 I am just going to use uh, i j here. So, let us evaluate this quantity now. What is n? Minus sin theta. So, n dot t dot e 1 gives me minus sin theta e 1 minus cos theta e 2 dotted with tau i j e i e j okay dotted with e 1 now when you are doing this dot product i am going to look at this term this term dotted with this will contribute only when i is equal to 1, okay. So, I have minus sin theta, when I take this term with this, I will get tau 1 j, okay. And when I do take the second term here and I take the dot product here, I, remember I need to take the dot product with the adjacent uh, vectors and I need i equals 2 here, only then this is going to contribute. So, I am going to have minus cosine theta tau 2 j, okay, e 2 dotted with e 2 will be 1, I get cosine, yeah, i will be equal to 2, so it is 2 and j remains as it is, okay. And this guy, the E j remains as it is dotted with E 1. Now, this is going to contribute only when j is equal to 1. This will have a contribution only when j is 1. If j is equal to 2, E 2 dotted E 1 is 0, okay. So, if j is equal to 1, I have minus sin theta tau 1 1 minus cosine theta tau 2 1. Remember y was equal to x and x is equal to 1, 1 is equal to x and 2 is equal to y, sorry, okay. So, if I go back and I write this minus sin theta, I have tau x x minus cosine theta tau y x and this should be the same as what I had earlier. Only thing is I used for the normal thing there, I used uh, sigma as my uh, this thing. So, remember here the tau represents actually the complete normal component, which means the sigma and the p are included. I mean, sorry, this is uh, the way I have written it, I have written it as tau, but this is actually sigma, 
this is a complete normal uh, uh, stress component. Okay, so I just want to tell you that this is the same as what we had there. So this is just to illustrate to you that physically you can could have gotten the component acting in the direction x on the surface whose normal is n doing those force balances. But I mean you can't keep drawing those surfaces again and again. So tomorrow if you are to give, be given a surface, you should be in a position to directly calculate what the stress component is. Okay, and then I would just use this formula. If you want to um, get the component in the y direction and that's something for you to do. You can, I'm not going to do this, but what I want you to do is, I've done this in the x direction. I want you to do the same thing in the y direction. Uh, do it physically, do it using the formula, n dot t dot e2 in this case, and see if you're getting the same thing, okay? That's for you to just uh, practice. So, basically, as we wanted, the mathematical and the physical way, the mathematical and the physical approach give the same result. In fact, if they didn't, we would be in trouble. Okay, so that's just a justification. Well, I didn't really do any uh, proof of how that thing came n dot t dot t, but this is just more of an illustration of how that actually gives you the uh, component uh, that we're interested in. Okay, so uh, homework problem establish. the similarity in the y direction. Okay, so now the question comes um, as to how do we go about um, using it for an actual problem, right? Let us go back because we start off with this beautiful tapering jet, right? I do not know if you think it is beautiful, but anyway, it is uh, a tapering jet. R and uh, the way the surface is going to be de defined here, the surface of the tapering jet is given as r is equal to function of z. Clearly, okay. It can also be a function of time and for the sake of simplicity, just to tell you how the calculation of n is done. So what are we going to do now? We are going to talk about, um, for simplicity, We assume theta symmetry and steady state, okay? So that there is no time dependency and no theta dependency. Theta symmetry means irrespective of what the theta position is, it is the same, it is independent of theta. Now, uh, so that I can, you know, uh, do things in a very simple way, I can give the more complicated problems as homework for you guys to do, right? I can write the same surface equation as we can also describe the surface as f of r comma z equals r minus f of z equals 0, okay? This f is an alternative, shall I say implicit representation 
of the surface r equals f of z is an explicit representation of the surface okay so now uh, if you have a surface which is given by r is equal to f of z explicit i can always rewrite it as r minus f of z equal to 0 and that is your implicit representation f is a function of both r and z clearly now if you remember your calculus what is the normal to the surface called because that is what we are interested in on the surface how do we go about finding the normal the normal is going to be given by the gradient of f okay and since we like to deal with unit vectors the unit normal vector I am going to divide the vector by the absolute value or the magnitude of this so this gives me the unit normal vector okay how is the gradient going to be calculated you just calculate the the gradient operator is nothing but d by dr of er f is a scalar of course plus d by dz of ez i am forgetting about the theta direction so i am not writing the theta component okay so gradient of f is what i am going to have to differentiate this thing with respect to r that gives me unity okay so the component in the r direction is just er because this is independent of r and the component in the z direction i just differentiate this with respect to z i get minus f prime of z ez that is my numerator that is my gradient i want to normalize it so how do i normalize it i just divide it by the magnitude of this guy so i get 1 plus f prime squared okay so that is what, what have I done I have just cal told you for a given surface how to calculate the normal so supposing you have a surface in a problem which is given by z is equal to uh, f of r or z is equal to f of x or y or t whatever it is you know how to go about calculating the gradient okay once you know uh, about calculating the gradient and you get the normal then you are in a position to at least get the n dot t and suppose you are interested in the normal stress balance you need n dot t dot n so you, you already got the uh, stress component that you are interested in okay in terms of the unknown surface f okay now let us uh, now that the n is given so this is my n okay so oh, wait 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 I need to this is gradient I, th I think I need to do this thing step by step that is just the gradient and uh, I need to do this as gradient of f I am doing too many things in one shot and n is this okay yeah okay so the gradient operator is defined as this gradient of f is given by that and the unit normal is given by this okay what about the tangent because those are the two things we are normally interested in because the, when I am trying to impose boundary conditions I am normally doing a balance of the forces on an arbitrary surface in the normal direction and in the tangential direction so I need to know the normal direction and the tangential directions okay so the tangential direction how is that going to be given clearly the tangential direction has to be perpendicular to the normal direction okay and uh, the tangential direction is going to be given by f prime of z er plus ez divided by square root of 1 plus f prime squared how would I get this I just am making sure that the dot product of n and t is 0 okay I just uh, the denominator does not bother me it just comes that because it is normalizing the f prime has 
been moved to ER, I have changed the sign here and now this has a component of unity. So now I have um, this uh, follows from t dot n being equal to 0, okay. Just want to mention a couple of small things. Um, what we are talking about here is f prime of z. f prime of z, remember, is nothing but df by dz. Okay. And the way we've written it, f is f of z is nothing but r, small f. So this is the same as dr by dz. Because usually there is some confusion people have regarding this implicit and explicit dependency. So I just want to do one thing here to show you uh, how these are related. It is a pretty much simple calculus. We also have f of r comma z equals 0 on the surface. So everywhere on the surface, the capital F is 0, correct? So, so that means what? The changes in f will also be 0. This means df equals 0 on the surface. But what is df? When I am moving along the surface, there is a change both in r as well as in z. So df is nothing but the partial derivative of f with respect to r times dr plus partial derivative of f with respect to z times dz, this must be equal to 0, okay. So what I have done is I am trying to show the relationship between the total derivative of the small f with z with the partial derivatives of capital F with r and z. Clearly, you can just move things around a little bit and you can get dr by dz as being equal to minus df by dz divided by df by dr. And this is equal to f prime of z. So if you had an explicit relationship, I would use f prime. If you had an implicit relationship, I would calculate f prime using this, okay. And uh, then I will use it in the formula. So you have to be careful about uh, whether you are using an implicit relationship or an explicit relationship when you are proceeding, okay. So I just wanted to show you this equivalence of these two because uh, sometimes people do the wrong thing. Okay, so we have learned how to calculate the normal direction, we have learned how to calculate the tangential direction and uh, given a particular surface F. There are two things we need to do now. One is to learn how to do the use the boundary conditions in the normal direction, in the tangential direction and one more thing which is when the surface itself is changing with time, how do you uh, track the surface, okay. So th uh, th those are the things which are remaining. So now the three questions are are tracking the interface, okay, to applying the normal stress boundary condition and three, the tangential stress boundary condition. Since we are talking about tracking the interface, we clearly have a dynamic problem. Things have to change with time, okay. So now I am going to go to, um, to the first question or rather the answer to the first question, A1. Since the interface 
changes with time, we have a dynamic situation. This means a function the interface, let us say, we will keep things simple, z is now going to be a function of x, y and t. I have just uh, pulled a fast one, I have just gone back to the Cartesian coordinates, okay. So now we are just uh, doing this in Cartesian coordinates. So what does this mean? Let us say you have an interface. I mean, you know, um, this interface looks very smooth, so things are changing. This is my z direction, this is my x direction, and that's my y direction. So, remember you are on the beach, you see these waves on the surface. So, the interface is actually the going to be a function both of the distance into the beach, that is the y direction, along the coast, that is the x direction, and z is the height of the interface. So, clearly things are changing with time at every point, okay. And what I am doing is, I am just writing this dependency. So, this is my f, f, or in this case, since it is height, maybe I should use h. Okay, so let us just uh, not confuse the issue here, but I am just telling you that the interface is going to be given by z of f of x comma y comma t. That is my interface. So, instead of only one direction, now I have just generalized it to 2, okay. And since I am working with Cartesian, you know how to you calculate the uh, gradient operator and all that very elegantly, and it is dynamic. I am going to go back to what we did earlier, which is go to the implicit representation of the function of the surface. So, I am going to write f of x comma y comma z comma t as being equal to z minus f of x comma y comma t equal to 0. This is the implicit representation. of the surface, okay. Now clearly, at any time, any point on the surface, capital F has to be 0, okay. So what does this mean? If you were to look at the material derivative, how the particles on the surface are actually moving, that is going to be characterized by the material derivative being equal to 0. Okay. So, what I am saying is f, just like the argument last time, f was 0, or therefore df was 0 along the surface. So, f equal to 0 on the surface. So, here we have for the particles on the surface df by dt equal to 0, okay. Now, you know how to calculate this material derivative. df by dt is nothing but the partial derivative of f with respect to t plus v dot del f. That is what we did some time back when we were talking about the Euler's acceleration formula. So, I am just going to use that now. So, we have uh, df by dt equals partial derivative of f respect to t plus v dot del f, correct? v dot del f. This is from uh, what we saw a few lectures back and this must be equal to 0. Now, when I look at the partial derivative of f with respect to t, uh, capital F with respect to t is the, is the same as the negative of the small f with respect to t, 
remember x, y, z are actually independent now in my uh, explicit formulation. So this is nothing but minus df by dt plus I am going to uh, stick to this velocity vector as it is and the gradient vector is nothing but the partial derivative of f with respect to x times e x okay, uh, minus of partial derivative of f with respect to x times e x minus the partial derivative of f with respect to y times e y and when I differentiate this with respect to z, I get unity plus e z. This is my gradient of capital F in terms of small f. All I have done is just uh, taking the gradient of that, just d by dx of that and I get df by dx, df by dy and that, okay. So, and this of course equals 0. So this implies, let me just say that this implies 0 equals that and I am going to do something uh, very simple which is uh, write this in terms of the components, take the dot products and uh, move these guys which are negative to the left hand side. So but maybe I have learned my lesson, I should do this one step at a time. So I am just going to move this df by dt here, I am going to write this as vx ex plus v y e y plus v z e z dotted with minus d f d x e x minus d f d y e y plus e z. And do the dot product, this gives me minus v x d f d x minus v y d f d y plus v z okay and this basically means d f by d t plus v x d f d x plus v y d f d y equals v z. This particular equation it tells me how f is changing with respect to time. How does the e interface evolve with time? Okay, and this is called the kinematic boundary condition. So, if you have an unsteady state problem, and this we are going to see later on, later on when we talk about st stability of multiphase flow systems we will have the interface which is actually changing with respect to time. So when the interface is changing with respect to time, you need to be able to track the interface and the tracking of the interface is actually done using this, okay. And uh, so then I would use this to find out how my uh, interface position changes. If you have a steady state situation, of course, this particular df by dt is not going to be present, okay. Um, so when we solve some uh, perturbation problems later on, we may be uh, neglecting uh, the time derivative term. What I want you to emphasize, uh, see here is, supposing the interface is flat, supposing the interface is flat, it means that f is independent of x and y. It means the partial derivative of f with respect to x and the partial derivative of f with respect to y will be 0 which means that df by dt will be equal to vz. That means the rate at which the height is changing will be given by the vertical component of the velocity. So that is basically consistent. So I think whenever you derive some an equation, I expect you to you know sit down and see if in some limiting cases it boils down to something which is consistent with what you expect or is there an inconsistency. So that is basically what I am trying to show you here. If you have a flat interface, if the interface is flat, then f is independent of, 
of x and y. Okay, because the shape is uh, I'm telling you is flat. Don't ask me how it's being flat, it's flat. Okay. So now z is a function of t alone. And what does the kinematic condition give me? I'm going to write this as the kinematic boundary condition implies df by dt equals vz. So the rate at which the f, the height is increasing with time must be the same as the velocity, okay. And that's possibly common sense, right. So that's, uh, so basically what I'm saying is this is consistent with our physical intuition. So um, I'll just uh, write here that this boundary condition is useful in determining stability of multi-phase flows where the interface deforms, okay. Now in order to keep life a bit simple, what I will do is I will just write uh, the answer to question number 3 which is um, A3. I think that was the tangential stress condition, right? The tangential stress condition basically tells you that on an interface, on an interface with outward normal n, n dot t dot t in the first liquid equals n dot t dot t of the second liquid. I want to qualify this a little bit now. This is the, con this tells you that the stress, tangential stress exerted by one liquid on the other is equal to that exerted by the second liquid on the first. This is true only as long as there is no variation of surface tension along the interface. Okay, this is an implicit assumption. Later on in the course, we'll re relax this assumption. Okay, so this is we have as long as the surface tension does not change along the interface. And there is a small derivation to take into account the uh, variation of the surface tension. I am going to do it later on in the course. I do not want to make it too mathematical because right now I think we need to uh, we establish so, some framework. We need to start solving some problems. So that will possibly keep the interest alive otherwise it becomes too mathematical and people uh, go crazy. Okay. So what we are doing is this particular thing I am tacitly assuming that there is no surface tension variation along the course, uh, along the, <laughs> the interface. So now, um, but there is a problem uh, which is basically called a Marangoni convection problem. And in the Marangoni convection, so whenever you people read Marangoni convection, you will see that that is the tangential stress has an extra term which takes, uh, incorporates the gradient in the surface tension. So if we have a surface tension gradient, exists, then uh, this condition is modified 
and uh, an example of this problem is the Marangoni convection problem and I guarantee you will see this later on in the course okay so just to build up some suspense here. I will answer A2 now I am not sure if my uh, this has already been done in the class before so I am uh, I will talk to them and I will possibly derive it uh, tomorrow if it has not been done. The normal stress boundary condition supposing we have an interface okay and this is fluid 1 and this is fluid 2 and this is the direction of the normal. So, the normal is pointing from fluid 1 to fluid 2. The normal stress boundary condition and in the most general form is going to be given by n dot t dot n in fluid 2 minus n dot t dot n in fluid 1 as being equal to sigma the surface tension times del dotted with n okay. Now, if this has not been derived I may not formally derive it I will derive this equation and that other equation formally later, but I will give a, a hand waving derivation later on I mean maybe tomorrow. What is uh, going on here? This sigma is the surface tension and what does this term represent del dot n it represents the curvature okay. So, you have actually um, seen um, this formulation in your courses in hydrostatic when you had a meniscus or a bubble you talk about pressure terms things are not moving there okay you do not have uh, liquids in motion fluids in motion, but everything is static. So, the only contribution to the stress tensor terms are going to be the diagonal elements which are the pressure elements okay and you have P 1 minus P 2 give is equal to sigma divided by R something like that okay or 2 sigma divided by R. So, that the 1 by R or the 2 by R that you talk you have seen earlier is coming from the curvature term. What I have done here is instead of writing it in terms of 1 by r, I have just generalized the formulation in terms of del dot n because in general you will have an arbitrary surface where you have a normal. So, given the normal, the, uh, if you were to find the divergence of the normal, that tells you what the curvature is, and that curvature should simplify. So, this formula should simplify to your 1 by r or 2 by r for a cylinder or a sphere, okay. That we will check. So, this is basically your sigma by r and this would be p 1 minus p 2 equal to uh, 2 gamma by r or something like that okay. So, what I have done is this is just a generalized boundary condition condition in the normal direction okay. So, I think basically what we have is we have established all that we need we have the differential equations, the equation of continuity, the uh, equation of momentum, the Navier-Stokes equation, we have the uh, boundary conditions, the kinematic boundary condition. So, we will, uh, we are all set to solve problems, okay. <laughs>